Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the um, 22nd uh, McLean Fellows Conference. Um, uh, the conference uh, is a conference in memory of uh, Dorothy Jean McLean, uh, who was uh, the early uh, benefactor and supporter and developer uh, of the McLean Center. Um, also, uh, Marianne McLean is here, and Barry McLean is close by. Um, and uh, we thank them for their ongoing uh, support of the center. Uh, the, the first day of the conference, as you know, is devoted to healthcare disparities, um, uh, both from a national, global perspective, and also in the second half this afternoon, uh, from a local perspective. Um, uh, there, there is one important change that I have to tell you about the, the, the first uh, group of speakers, um, and that is uh, that Dr. Peter Singer from Toronto uh, has been ill for a few weeks and was unable to travel. Um, what, what we will do is hear from Dr. Daniels, uh, Jim Heckman, and then Gene Washington, uh, and then we will show a short video uh, by Dr. Singer's colleague, from Toronto, Dr. Dar. Um, and then the panel, when it gathers up here, will include the three speakers and Dr. Fumio Lapati, uh, who um, has been in touch with Dr. Dar, will be sitting in for Dr. Dar on the panel. Um, well, with that background, um, let, let me introduce our first speaker. Uh, Professor Norm Daniels uh, is the Mary B. Saltonstall Professor of Population Ethics and a professor of ethics and population health uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health in their Department of Global Health. Um, as many of you know, Professor Daniels um, is perhaps the, um, uh, the foremost uh, uh, philosophical scholar uh, in the world uh, on issues of social justice and allocation of health resources. Uh, this is a topic that he's worked on uh, for the better part of 30 years, Norm, 30 plus years. Um, uh, he formerly had been the Goldwaith uh, Professor and Chair of the Philosophy Department at Tufts, um, has published widely on uh, topics of philosophy of science, medical ethics, social philosophy, distributive justice. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Norm to the university and to the conference. Norm Banks. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. I wish I could see you better, but um, uh, so I could make a little more eye contact. But um, in any case, um, it's a great honor to be here, and I thank uh, Mark for the invitation. And uh, I have had the pleasure of meeting uh, um, the McLeans and some of the sponsors of the um, fellowship. So it's been a, a very nice visit for me. Um, I wanted to talk today about uh, a topic that I've been concerned about for many years. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about several related issues. Um, the first uh, part of the talk will focus a little bit on domestic health issues and the account of distributive justice that I give was largely uh, aimed at trying to work out the implications of how we should think about what we owe each other uh, within a particular society. Um, I then began to think more about what this meant or this view meant for our attitude towards health disparities domestically. And that's what the third bullet is about. Uh, but we have global uh, health disparities that are at least as large and often larger than our domestic disparities. And I wanted to conclude by saying a few things about those um, since we, uh, the conference bridges all of these areas. I won't be saying anything very specific about local disparities, but um, I'm sure there are people who will address that topic uh, 
themselves. Um, what I'm drawing on in this uh, are uh, some ideas from a book that came out in 2008 called Just Health, um, which is uh, an attempt to integrate views I've developed over 30 years around justice and health. Um, so let me start with, uh, with this particular uh, intuition and go to the first topic. Um, what do we owe each other by way of health and uh, protection of health and uh, health care? And when I use the word health care or the term health care, um, I usually am thinking about things that fall in the health sector. Uh, so I actually would like to include both traditional public health measures and personal medical services, which are two rather different areas. But I distinguish them from a lot of the rest of the work on the causes of health uh, that we'll hear more about today. Um, the fundamental idea goes something like this. Uh, why do we think health is of particular moral importance? And what put that question into my mind is the fact that in many societies, um, uh, perhaps including ours, um, but certainly uh, many of the developed countries and some middle-income countries, uh, there is a concern to distribute health care, personal medical services especially, more equally or equitably than many other goods in those societies. Uh, and uh, this contrast could be viewed in part as a kind of schizophrenia on the part of those societies, or we might look for a justification. And I began by trying to look for something that might make sense out of that attitude, uh, since I too for many years wanted healthcare to be distributed more equally or equitably within our society than it was. Uh, so the intuition I had is that departures from uh, good health, uh, let's think of those as departures from normal functioning, and I know there is controversy about uh, how to understand the notion of normal functioning. Perhaps we have time and discussion for that. But I'm just going to take departures from normal functioning to be a way of characterizing what we measure and study in schools of public health, such as the one that I belong to, uh, and what much of the health sector pays attention to. Um, so why are departures from normal functioning so important? Uh, the answer I came up with is they have a limited but distinct implication or impact on the range of opportunities open to individuals in a given society. Uh, so that if we meet health needs, we keep people functioning closer to normally, and that has a positive effect on the range of uh, opportunities they can exercise. This idea is not dissimilar uh, in content to Amartya Sen's discussion of capabilities. Uh, and an exercisable opportunity is something that I find it hard to distinguish from his notion of a capability. So if health shortens our lives or reduces the range of functioning uh, within our life, then it makes certain uh, choices of plans of life less reasonable for us. Uh, and that, as far as I'm concerned, is a reduction in our exercisable opportunity range. So this then uh, raises the general question from the perspective of justice, uh, whether we have social obligations to protect that opportunity range. So I'm going to make a conditional claim today. I've tried to flesh it out a bit more in the book I mentioned. But the conditional claim is this. If we have social obligations to protect opportunity in a society, then we have a framework for thinking about the fair distribution of health care resources, and I think of that in a fairly broad way. Um, so that's the first uh, point I want to make. Um, uh, <coughs> so um, if we have uh, social obligations to promote health, then we want to address the 
departures from normal functioning as resources reasonably permit. And I have a whole discussion in some of my other writings, I'll return briefly to it later, uh, to how we might go about making decisions about resource allocation, given that reasonable people will have many disagreements about what those resource, what, when a resource allocation is fair. So my general point today is that this opportunity account gives us reasons for wanting to promote population health and to distribute it fairly. It's not simply uh, making health care more equal um, or health more equal among the population, but improving the range of uh, health functioning in the society. Um, and that is because if we uh, make people uh, cl bring people closer to normal functioning, whether we do that equally or not across the whole population, we are meeting individual claims to have the op their opportunities range, uh, range protected. Um, uh, I think we have further obligations to try to distribute that health more equitably. Uh, I'm going to turn in a second to the question, when are health inequalities in a society unjust and not simply unequal? Um, and uh, there we might think when they are unjust, we have extra reason perhaps to reduce them rather than simply just bring up uh, aggregate measures of population health or reduce other health inequalities as resources permit. Um, we have extra reason because, uh, as I'm going to argue, the inequalities that I count as unjust are the ones that are the result of an unfair or unjust distribution of the socially controllable factors that affect health. And so the picture that I have is that, in some sense, social practices have helped to bring about uh, the ill health of worse off groups. And that gives us perhaps an extra reason to try to mitigate those effects. So that's the picture I have. And we can discuss whether I'm right later. Um, so let me turn to the question, when are health inequalities unjust? <clears throat> now, I used to think there was a fairly simple answer to this question, and that was because I was in the grip when I first wrote a, 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 the parts of a book called Just Healthcare uh, that it came out in 1985. And I was not very aware at that time, I'm not at all aware, of the lit literature on the social determinants, which had just started to become apparent. The Black Report in England had been published in 1980, but the Thatcher administration quickly shoved that under the rug, and it often didn't attract attention uh, elsewhere. Um, so the myth I was in the grip of basically said, well, health care, public health and medical services, were the main determinants of population health. And if that was true, then it seemed to me that unequal health could largely be attributed to unequal access to health care. And that seemed uh, an implication that was fairly simple. Of course, biological factors are involved as well. But if we want to talk about population groups having differences in health status, that, uh, that were the result of access to health care, then that arguably was grounds for viewing those inequalities as unjust. Um, after that time, however, uh, I ra rather um, uh, quickly became aware of the literature on the social determinants of health. And, um, by the mid-90s was working with some people at Harvard to try to think through what did this broader view of the social determinants as causes of health and its distribution in a population. What did that mean for concerns about what we owe each other? Uh, so uh, I want to uh, bring out uh, some way, a particular way of thinking about that. So the general point I want to make is that health inequalities uh, that are then viewed, on my view, as unjust 
if they're the result of an unjust, the just distribution of the socially controllable factors affecting health. Now, I know the, um, some of you will immediately pounce on the fact that the word unjust appears twice in that um, characterization, uh, but I'm going to try to illustrate what I mean by the second appearance uh, um, uh, shortly. Um, so this is a graph familiar to many of you who've looked at the literature on social determinants of health. And I wasn't sure how much to presuppose about that when I came here. I know uh, Professor Heckman is going to talk about the social determinants soon, so I won't say much. But I did want to at least introduce a basic idea. Uh, this is from a graph of the relationship between occupational status and health in one of the Whitehall studies, which is a study of the British civil servants uh, in England. Uh, this is from an old paper, 15 years old, by Marmot and Shipley. And what it uh, suggests, if you look at the bars in this uh, and draw a slope across each group of bars, what you'll see is uh, an upwardly sloping uh, line, um, which in effect uh, represents what's uh, in the literature known as a socioeconomic gradient of health. And in pr this particular case, what you have here is a measure of occupational status in the British, uh, in the British uh, civil service. The tallest bar um, are the people at highest risk. That's uh, this, on the vertical axis, you have a relative mortality rate. So uh, the two is roughly twice as high a mortality rate as the one, uh, which is the horizontal middle point of the graph. And that tall bar in each of the groupings uh, is other workers. And that largely means blue collar uh, and the lowest, so, uh, the lowest uh, occupational status in the British civil service. The graph that is, extends uh, most below the bar um, will be uh, high level administrators in the British civil service. So they have a much lower than average mortality rate. And so what this represents is the inverse relationship between wealth and health, or in this case, mortality, uh, but this relationship is very robust across many measures of health outcomes and also across a relatively broad measure of uh, SES indicators, so education and so on work as well. Um, so this socioeconomic gradient of health is particularly interesting in this graph, and that's what I, in the heels of American health reform, wanted to emphasize to you, is that <clears throat> this was done uh, decades after the introduction of the National Health Service in the UK. So this population has access to universal coverage. Not only that, it doesn't contain any people who are impoverished. And further, it uh, contains only people with a relatively high basic level of uh, education. Uh, so uh, we're not talking about the contrast between impoverization and being well off in a society. This is not a dichotomous relationship between the haves and the have-nots, but it's a spectrum of health that is connected to some of the social factors that are distributed in various ways in different societies uh, outside the health sector. So occupational status is not particularly a health-related issue, but you can see it's correlated, and this is only a correlational study, it doesn't talk about mechanisms, uh, uh, it's correlated with health. Um, this is of extremely, in, uh, in, in extremely great importance and very suggestive because one wants to find out why does this happen and what do you do about it? And that's what I take a lot of the discussion today going, is going to be about. Um, so uh, what this whole body of literature put in mind to me was uh, the following slogan. Uh, which goes something like this. Remember my uh, 
remark earlier that justice, um, uh, that uh, we, I will consider a health inequality on justice if it's the result of an unfair or unjust distribution of the socially controllable factors affecting health. How socially controllable uh, is a matter for discussion. What do we do about occupational status? Is there a way to mitigate the consequences of that on health if that's working in some direct way on health? Uh, uh, we don't know, um, and uh, we probably uh, don't have an awful lot of data on exactly how to do that. Uh, but the general slogan that emerged in my mind was that social justice, that is the fair distribution of those determinants of health, is good for our health. And that's an interesting result, and I'll try to show you why that's interesting in a minute. Um, so, Remember, I made a conditional claim that if we have social obligations to protect health, uh, protect opportunity, then we have a framework for thinking about how to deal with health. Well, at the time that I first developed these ideas, there was only one prominent theory of justice that really emphasized talk about equality of opportunity. And uh, in the late 70s when I did this, that was John Rawls's. Uh, theory of justice. Um, so I want to make the following claim, and this is more developed in the book I mentioned, but uh, John Rawls articulates, uh, and I'm not going to argue for them, several principles that he considers to be the principles that we would agree to as fair terms of cooperation in a kind of social contract position that he articulates. Among those principles are a principle equal, guaranteeing equal basic liberties, including fair participation rights to all. And he very explicitly attacked uh, an earlier version of the Citizens United versus United ruling of the Supreme Court, namely the Buckley versus Vallejo decision, um, uh, in which he said that there was, uh, in the uh, interpretation of that court, which in effect said individuals have freedom of expression to spend all their money, including rich individuals like Ross Perot and uh, Mitt Romney and others, on their own elections because that was tantamount to their freedom of expression. And the Constitution protects that. And Rawls argued against that. So he was very interested in protecting what he called the fair worth or value of political participation rights to all individuals. So this was a, very, a fairly robust principle, not very um, uh, uh, to be uh, easily uh, understood in, in some of the ways we view uh, constraints on um, financing in elections in the United States. Um, Rawls's second principle after this equal basic liberties has two clauses, one of which is the fair equality of opportunity principle. And by that, he meant a principle that corrected for, say, through public education measures, the inequalities in the development of talents and skills that people would bring to market. Uh, so he wanted jobs and offices to be open to people based on their talents and skills and not other irrelevant factors about them, but he wanted those to be the talents and skills they would have if they were corrected for by these institutions. Um, okay. Um, now, the other part of Rawls's principle, uh, second principle, is a principle severely constraining um, income and wealth inequalities in society. He said we should allow inequalities, and it's not just in income and wealth, but as measured by what he called an index of primary social goods. Um, this, uh, uh, so we would allow inequalities on this view only if they made the worst off groups as well off as possible. And that's a very significant constraint on inequality. If you add all these things up, then you've got um, the basis for the thesis I'm making, namely if we distributed the goods in the ways that these principles suggested with severe constraints on income and wealth inequality, with robust protection for uh, access to health and he uh, public health measures, uh, with uh, fair distribution of education in the society, 
um, with guarantees of political participation rights, then his claim is that one, then my claim is that one would in fact be flattening the socioeconomic gradients of health very significantly compared to anything we see around us. Um, and so there might still be residual inequalities and we could then discuss are those unfair or not. I'm gonna leave that aside as a matter for discussion. But, um, uh, and it's a, th a question of some theoretical interest. Um, we're nowhere near conforming to these principles, so I'm not viewing this as a matter of real practical interest. Uh, but the basic idea is that we could distribute health much more equally, and according to some views of the social determinants, doing that would create a climate in which we actually promote population health in the aggregate as well. Uh, I don't want to put any weight on that hypothesis, but uh, it is an empirical hypothesis in the field. Um, so um, that's my claim, is that uh, we, we could flatten these gradients. But now I want to pose a problem. Uh, the problem is, whenever we invest resources, uh, whether they're healthcare or education and so on, and they're not divisible in certain ways like money, but we're talking about programs that do something, and so the money that's involved in setting up a program, um, then on my view, we encounter a range of distributive problems we don't know how to address. And reasonable people will disagree about how to address those problems. Uh, because this kind of reasonable disagreement pervades many of the resource allocation decisions decisions we make, um, then on my view, we actually um, need to re retreat from an effort to find a principled basis for resource allocation to a kind of fair process, a deliberative fair process for resolving disputes. Uh, so that's my thesis, and uh, we can come back to that in questions, but it's in general the claim that um, uh, when we try to redress inequalities in this way, we don't avoid a set of problems such as this, um, uh, the priorities problem. How much priority do we give to individuals who are worst off? Um, we might take extreme positions and say none, no priority. Cost effectiveness analysis has that as an implication. Uh, or we might say we give maximum priority Certain views in ethics have that implication, a uh, kind of prioritarian view. Uh, I find both views implausible, and so do most other people who have a kind of middle range position. But that middle range is not describable by principle, and reasonable people will disagree about the trade-offs, say, between how much weight to give pri uh, as priority to worst off individuals and how much good we can do by treating them. Uh, so reasonable people disagree about this, and thus I think we need a fair, deliberative process for resolving this dispute. Um, uh, now, let me in the last three minutes or so that I have available, um, uh, turn to um, global inequality. So far, I've really only been talking about a framework for thinking about domestic inequalities. But the global equality, inequalities we face are severe, and there is some controversy in the philosophical literature about them. Are these questions of global justice or are these simply questions about humanitarian responses we ought to have? Uh, now what I'm going to suggest is that we ought to adopt a kind of middle ground that views these as concerns about justice but uh, of a special sort. So uh, the inequalities I'm referring to are very familiar to many of you. Life expectancy in Swaziland is half that of Japan where I was, where I was yesterday. Um, child under five mortality is 100 times as great in sub-Saharan Africa as in any of the OECD countries. And the intuition that many of us have is that the gross inequality in health prospects is unfair. Um, 
Now, we could get around this claim of, uh, uh, and try to flesh out accounts of justice in various ways. Um, one prominent view is one articulated by Tom Pogge, a uh, philosopher now at Yale, uh, and he wants to argue that we are under general moral obligations not to harm other people, and that many of the health inequalities we can see in the world are traceable to the harms that rich countries impose on poor countries. This itself is an empirically questionable hypothesis, uh, and um, uh, I actually want to suggest a slightly different view. Uh, if one looks at the sources of global health inequalities, and I don't mean this list of three categories to be exclusive, we find that some of the global inequalities are contributed to by domestic injustices. And then the question is, to what extent are other countries responsible for injustices that are promoted domestically in some country. If one country is racist, for example, then do other countries have to make up for it by contributing more? That's an interesting question. So uh, does Norway owe us more uh, support because it uh, is less racist than we are, uh, perhaps? Um, uh, but then uh, some of the inequalities we see are inequalities in other conditions that affect health, like natural vectors for diseases and other considerations. And we might think of that as something that gives rise to uh, global obligations to share resources more fairly. Uh, the third body has to do with international practices. And some of these might be thought of as harmful and others uh, as not intended to be harmful and maybe even helpful. So if we look at this graph, um, which is a, an old version of a graph that many of you have seen, plot, it plots life expectancy by country against um, gross domestic pra, uh, product per capita on the average. And you see uh, what you typically see is a concave curve rapidly rising at low income levels. Uh, and flattening out. But what strikes me as most important about this graph is the enormous variance that one sees at, uh, even in the left part of the graph, uh, very poor countries that are equally poor will have very different health outcomes. And so the conclusion I draw from that is that policy matters. What you do with your resources, even at low levels, matters a lot. Um, and you can see the same variance among richer countries. Uh, so the implication of this is that policy matters at least as much as wealth. And this is true even in very poor states uh, or uh, countries. Um, uh, in the US, the contribution of social practices uh, on top of uh, lack of insurance and access to health care um, contributes to the lower outcomes um, uh, that um, constitutes some of America's gap with other rich countries. Um, now, as far as international harming goes, which was Tom Pogge's uh, claim, I think that's not implausible with regard to some things, like the brain drain of health workers from the south to the north and the active recruiting of those workers. I think it's less plausible uh, when one looks at some other uh, goods like pharmaceuticals, where uh, the, I think the, the situation is that uh, our incentives to producers of drugs are not as good as they could be, and we don't address some of the kinds of um, burden of disease that appears in other countries. Uh, and we might want to restructure some of that. But that's a case not of harming those other countries, since their essential drug lists are all composed of drugs that have spun off of uh, these uh, products of the pharmaceutical companies over years, but rather that we're not doing as much as those companies could do. So we need a different account about the robust production of uh, an obligation to help. Uh, and so that's what I've sketched here, is that Pogge's minimalist account works better for some cases than others, but I don't think is in general adequate 
And I think, and this is my last uh, point, is that we need to find a middle ground between uh, certain uh, philosophical views that basically view citizens as citizens of the globe or the cosmos uh, or wherever they are and regardless of any kinds of institutional connections that they have to each other. And on the other hand, statist views, which only want to view justice as in the domain of nation states. And I think there is an, uh, a kind of middle ground. Uh, my friend Josh Cohn and Chuck Sable at NYU um, uh, have uh, argued um, that there are at least three uh, kinds of uh, middle ground institutional relationships that could give rise to concerns about justice. And I uh, think that these need to be explored more and we need to work out what we think justice means with regard to them. So that's my um, set of remarks on justice and health disparities. Uh, I tend to view the domestic disparity as clearer but still problematic because of the distributive issues that I raised, uh, or disagreements about how to reduce those inequalities, and the trade-offs we might have between equity and maximization of population health. I think those are significant ethical issues, and the, that's domestic, and then inter global. Uh, I view these inequalities as, in many cases, not necessarily all, but in many cases, giving rise to concerns about global justice, but I don't want to found them on uh, some of the traditional views, but want to try to find a middle ground for thinking about them. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker will, will be uh, James Heckman. Uh, Jim is the um, Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. Um, his work has been devoted to the development of a theoretical and empirical framework uh, to create a scientific basis for economic policy evaluation. And in terms of substantive issues, that he's looked at recently. They include job training programs, education, and also early childhood interventions. Um, uh, Professor Heckman has received uh, many awards for his work, including the uh, John Bates Clark Medal in 1983, uh, the Jacob Mincer Award for Lifetime Achievement in 2005, and the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2000. Uh, today, uh, in conjunction with Gabriella Conti, a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Economics, uh, Jim will present a, a talk uh, on following up on some of Norm's thoughts about social determinants of health on social determinants of health. Jim, welcome. I'm very pleased to be able to speak here today. I, uh, want to attest from my personal experience that uh, Mark Siegler is not only a very good medical ethicist and a good organizer of workshops, but a good personal physician. Uh, I, I, <laughs> so uh, the work today that I'm presenting is with Gabriella Conti. And as Mark said, it's on uh, uh, social economic determinants of health disparities, but it focuses on one particular aspect, which gets partly at what Professor Daniels was talking about, which was maybe avoiding some of the issues about the trade-off between uh, what's called efficiency and equity in economics. Uh, let me start with a report that I think has already been alluded to, or a series of studies. And uh, Michael Marmot recently presented a report to the British uh, uh, public. It was a large uh, panel uh, called uh, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, the so-called Marmot Review, but it was a panel of many distinguished scholars in England. And you can see this position, uh, I think you can see it, uh, which is that uh, essentially it was what we already heard, that essentially those with higher socioeconomic position have a greater array of life chances and they have better health. And this is a correlation that's been observed. And he, he talks about one dimension of education. And I want to focus on that kind of dimension of education today. But the key question in any of these areas, and especially in going out and designing policies, 
uh, is what, what can we do? How can we sort of move beyond the observation that we've already seen, and I'll show a little bit more of today, to make tangible policies that actually go towards reducing health disparities, and one that is based on evidence, and that one that will compete in an environment where funds are very, very tight uh, uh, today. And the key theme of this talk is that to design effective policy, we need to infer causation and to understand mechanisms. I think that'll be a term that'll be coming back to us all throughout the uh, sessions today, but we need to understand the mechanisms that produce the cause and where it's most effective, which, which interventions in which mechanisms are likely to be most effective. So let me just kind of add to the set of facts you've already seen. This is directly from the Marmot Report, and there are two dimensions. The uppermost figure is life expectancy in England measured against a, uh, a measure of deprivation, going from on, on the left-hand side, the most deprived, to the right-hand side, uh, the, the least deprived. And another measure on the bottom curve is a measure of uh, disability-free life expectancy. Uh, at birth, and, and this is, uh, all of these show the same kind of gradient we previously saw. Namely, that there is an association between social economic status and, uh, and health conditions in a variety of measures. And just to look at one example from the U.S. data, if we look at people below the poverty income level, so uh, the solid green bar, are those people at the highest uh, level, lowest level, I should say, in terms of family income, and those at the highest, we see the incidence of uh, people uh, who have uh, poor or fell, fair health decreasing rapidly as you move to the higher income levels. So this is an observation that's received a lot of attention and I want to talk about today. And this may seem facetious, but it's not because it's playing, uh, it's going to play a role in my talk today. This kind of gradient also shows up in monkeys and a lot of other animals where there's been experimentation. We actually have a body of data, which I'm going to summarize briefly, where we can actually look at monkeys and in particular rhesus monkeys that have many of the same genetic predispositions, uh, genetic endowments, I should say, as humans, and we get a, a notion which is very close to the marmot notion. We go to the bottom of the herd, to the, to the top, uh, uh, we, we, we essentially go uh, down. Now you're going the opposite direction from the other graphs, but basically uh, you find those who are at the top status. There are very, su very substantial and well-documented matriarchal hierarchies in the, in the monkey tribes, and we can actually see that the monkeys higher up do very well in terms of health, even though they have equal resources. But now the question always becomes, what are the causes of these empirical associations? And the World Health Framework, where marmot also had a hand, so marmot's going to play a role. I'm not trying to attack or, or defend marmot. I just simply want to say that marmot's a major figure. We'll hear probably a lot more about him. But Marmot, who uh, engineered this, basically said, why treat people and then send them back to the conditions that make them sick? And so this is a picture from the World Health Organization report. And in particular, this framework, which I'll come back to, but is a basically a position, there's a framework that kind of captures what's out there in a lot of the literature. Namely, the socio and economic and political context play a role. There's a very large set of cohesive factors, uh, not all fully documented, uh, where education, occupation, income, gender feed in uh, to material resources, the healthcare system, and produce the distribution of health and well-being. Now, what are the proposed solutions? And this now takes me back to the first slide, the Marmot Review Framework. And the Marmot Review Framework really features, exactly as we've heard, the notion of trying to reduce inequality. So the idea is to create a society that's just, create a society that reduces inequality, and to create in various places in society a framework for integrating people, uh, re redistributing resources, creating fair employment, giving children the best start in life, and creating healthy and developing uh, sustainable communities. And so this is a kind of a very broad uh, brush uh, approach. And this is taken directly from the 2010 Marmot Report, where he talks about a dynamic approach. And this is, the, hence, the theme today of the developmental approach that we want to think about sustainable communities, standard of living, but also recognize how skills and capabilities, the very term that we heard introduced from March of Sin, and you'll hear again in a minute, uh, essentially develop over the life cycle and are related to the early years, the school years, uh, the years of employment, and then into aging. So that's a very broad framework. But the question is, 
what do we really know about this, where to intervene in this? And that's the issue. And so uh, somewhat in a, in a deliberately provocative way, the Marmot Report simply says and raises this point and puts it out there ready in your face if you hadn't noticed it, uh, that these inequalities do not arise by chance. They can't be attributed simply to genetic makeup, uh, bad unhealthy behaviors or difficulty in access to medical care. But he argues that it's really social inequality. And in fact, some people have made this argument more strongly. But here's Marmot actually deciding in the introduction to his own Marmot report, which I'm happy to provide anybody if you haven't seen it, that he, Marmot, chaired this previous session, uh, this previous uh, uh, commission on social determinants of health. And he said, well, that was attacked as being ideology with evidence. And he would gladly accept the same charge on the current report. Namely, that he feels that these health inequalities are unfair and they really do produce a low productivity society. But I think we have to be a little bit cautious. I completely agree with the correlations and I completely agree with the evidence that there's a lot of evidence for correlation, for, for, for uh, inequality being a determinant. But we have to understand what aspects of inequality and which aspects might, in fact, be more readily addressed and where we might see social policy. Uh, being most effective. So uh, a somewhat more uh, sober uh, and more specific approach came from a recent uh, symposium that was produced at the New York Academy of Sciences called The Biology of Disadvantage. And uh, a paper, one of the concluding papers in that uh, special issue, uh, did point out that despite all this wealth, these notions of association, the evidence includes few studies, this whole evidence base that's out there since 1985 includes very few studies that rigorously establish the effectiveness of particular policies. And so what can we make out of the evidence on SES health gradients? What can we say? What are the factors that are most important? And can we really understand uh, what's going on here? And so I think what's important to put on the table is that we have to move beyond these associations to understand the nature of the causality of things like the income health relationship or the education health relationship. And we have to understand that there is a lot of controversy there. Some of the peers of uh, Marmot, people like George Davy Smith and United Kingdom and many others have criticized this report and reports are, are, are criticisms are going on asking, is it really inequality or is it the resources associated with inequality? That plays a fundamental role in thinking about how we might redesign society or redistribute resources within an existing society. So what I want to talk about in the rest of my uh, presentation is a framework that it helps us think about this. It doesn't go the full route, because I don't think anybody has gone the full route. I wish I could say I had completely integrated all this or could point to the work of another scholar. It hasn't been done, but it's undergoing uh, transformation, and we will see it. The economics of human development provides some way to think about these problems, and I want to summarize some of the studies from this work. So recent studies have established the following facts. A core, low-dimensional set of capabilities explains a variety of diverse socioeconomic outcomes. And I would use capabilities in exactly the sense of a march of sin. These are personal traits, but embedded in the larger society. And when we think about early conditions, cognitive, uh, non-cognitive capabilities, as well as early health conditions, they play a very powerful role in explaining not only adult behaviors, but also adult health. And what we've also come to understand, and this is something that I think is really important to understand, is that there are critical and sensitive periods. And that we have a sense, I uh, can't go into it in all detail, but for certain traits, for certain things like cognition, the early years, I mean talking about the years before age 10, and maybe even before age 5, are particularly important because there's a lot of stability in, in the rank of, in terms of IQ and cognition after the early years. For social and emotional skills, which are sometimes called non-cognitive skills, those gaps open up early as well. They persist strongly, but there's more variability, there's more move, there's more malleability, more flexibility. And what I would argue is that a policy that's focusing more on early childhood interventions, or at least addressing getting the capability base correct, or getting it, setting it off on the right trajectory, is a very effective strategy. I'm not going to argue that it's the whole strategy, but it's one that has not received enough attention, and I want to talk about this uh, uh, today. So let me just lay out a framework. So I've been set up. Uh, uh, sorry, I know there's a, there's a risk uh, economist, right? Uh, but this, there aren't many, many equations. 
This is just notation. So I really want to get the, this formalize the idea of capability. So capability is theta. And we can think of things that are large dimensional bundles, vectors of traits. So cognition, personalities, and health traits, the genetics of the human being. But what we've come to understand is this second relationship, that health depends on these capabilities and the environment and the investments that individuals make into these capabilities. And so I think, uh, uh, and I want to just sort of lay out this mechanism. And this framework essentially is what I want to point to. I don't know if this pointer works, it does. So for example, if you use the same notation, we want to think about what a life course development trajectory would look like. And it would look like we have prenatal conditions which are being studied. We have many people here in the audience, here at the university and around the world, looking at the importance of early environments, early poverty, uh, the effects of poverty and disadvantage in, in getting under the skin and, and affecting the whole trajectory of life uh, course. But what we see is prenatal conditions matter. Uh, I, as a member of investment, it's what the family and the society is putting into the individual. Here we actually see the parental environment playing a role, feeding in, and a dynamic process. It's this dynamic process that I really want to focus on uh, and talk about where in this dynamic process the evidence seems to point to the most effective interventions. So what we can argue is health disparities have early origins. That is something that has been fairly well documented. So it's not just the origins in, uh, not all disparities, certainly living next to a toxic waste site is not a good thing, but on the other hand, uh, at any stage in life, uh, but it's particularly dangerous when you're very young and living near lead and growing up and insulting the brain and the other parts of the biology early in life. So let me talk a little bit about one trait education, because that received a lot of attention in the Marmot Report, and it's received a lot of attention. So it's only a piece of the story. It's not the full global story, but I think it's an important piece, as I'll try to show you. And this gives you an idea of not only the disparities by education and health outcomes, but a lot of other measures in society. So we know this is a measure of education taken from English data, so to match the Marmot Report. We actually can look at the gradients, the differences by for males and females, and this is a very low level of education, not the level that the Marmot Report was talking about college education. This is just do you stay in school past the school leaving age. This is basically dropping out of school or not. And what you can see, for example, on the most leftmost side is hourly wage differences. They're not exactly the same for, uh, by educational status. They're not exactly the same for males and females, but they are, uh, they are both substantial. Uh, Full-time employment, again, the more educated are more likely to work. Consuming healthy diet, uh, fruits, exercise, not consuming fat and fried foods, obesity, definitely negatively related to education, and measures of fair and poor health, and smoking, which we know to be a major determinant of poor health, very strongly related to education. But what do we make of this? Uh, we, we, we certainly know, I'm here with a group of doctors, and you know that among uh, recent studies have shown that uh, smoking, uh, tobacco use, and poor diet, two of the items on the agenda that I just, on the previous slide, are some of the leading causes of, uh, preventable causes of death, things that are modifiable, or at least we think it might be modifi modifiable. So education plays a fairly substantial role in these factors which actually are causing disproportionate numbers of deaths. But the real question is, are these differences causal? Can we really just say, go out and give people more education, or for that matter, give people more money? Is this really a basis for policy, or are they arising from some other factors? And there are a lot of other candidate factors. We can imagine that traits, the, the genes that individuals have, the early environments, even the middle, uh, the schooling environments may, may in fact be needed. So what's needed is to really try to produce solid evidence here. And that's what I want to talk about uh, today. But let me just talk briefly about, give an anecdote, which is a medical anecdote, about correlation and causality. And I think there's a real danger here. It's something that American social policy is frequently confused. And I want to try to just uh, give you an example. So there's a great story told by an, uh, an economist from, with, a, with a Russian origin some, some 60 years ago. Picked it up from him. His name was F.C. Domar, uh, who talked about a cholera epidemic that occurred in Russia. And the government sent the doctors out to help the uh, peasants because they thought the, uh, uh, they thought the doctors could help prevent the cholera, help treat the patients. 
Now, the uh, peasants in the particular province observed a very high correlation between the number of doctors and the incidence of cholera in the area, and they banded together and created the social policy of murdering the doctors. So this is the kind of thing we want to avoid. Uh, I'm sure in this room it has a particularly receptive audience uh, to this story, but I think that's the danger. And we've had it in other areas, not just in healthcare policy, in poverty policy, and many other areas. So let me just give you a very simple graphic. You know, we can argue, and many people have, and I think that's the thrust of the Marmot Report, that education really does cause, uh, uh, causally affect health. So you see an arrow pointing education to health. But it could also be that early health could produce education. Uh, so people who are sick early on, there could be serious issues of impairment. Uh, ch may children like to be educated, and early health could be correlated with later health. There's a comparable discussion about income and health. Sick people typically aren't earning much income. At the same time, people who have more resources are probably healthier. So the question is, which way uh, is this causality go? Or is there some third factor sitting out there? These factors, these personal factors, which could also include early environmental factors and the society-wide factors that Marmot was talking about. So that's really the question. So let me just talk very briefly about a study that we did, again, looking at the same British data that constituted the essence of the Marmot Report. And what we do is we have very detailed measurements. So we go over the full life cycle of inequality and inequality development in, in Great Britain. So we have a group of people who are all born on the same week in 1970 in Britain. These people are now 40 years old, and they're being followed into the, over their whole lifetimes, unless the budget cuts get them. I don't know, maybe it will. But we do have detailed measurements, very detailed measurements on cognition, on personality, and on health. So I'll just summarize very brief uh, summary without getting into the details. So what we can do is we can control in a very rich way for what that association is. How much of the education difference is actually, how much of the difference by education that you observe, just you know, like the, the, the doctors there in, in the provinces of Russia, how much of the education gradient, those people have more educated or have better health, less smoking and so forth, how much does education constantly explain? How much can we say changing education, policies that promote education will actually reduce uh, that gradient? And what we argue is that it's education itself, causally, will explain about 70% of the smoking behavior, just the smoking behavior. Early life factors, however, play an important role, and it depends on the kind of condition. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And so what we can argue, and let me, just, let me just go through and show you just a, a visualization. This is back on the same chart I showed you. We shrunk it a little bit because we had a, a little bit of, in, but it's basically the same set of outcomes. And if you look at the components, this is just decomposing the components that I showed you into components that are causal, that are real causes, where policy can act. And how much of it is just due to some conditions that already existed at age 10, that we can see that a substantial part, even of the wage effect of education, arises because of uh, uh, selection effects, effects that occur before the age of 10, things to do with early family conditions, all the conditions that children face by age 10, early conditions. On the other hand, there's still a lot of room for improvement. And so in particular, if you look at smoking behavior, I don't know if I can find it here, I have an angle here, but you can see smoking behavior is here. A substantial part, that black band, is actually caused as a causal effect of education. And so here we can see across different kinds of outcome, wage inequality, even two-thirds of the difference in educational returns on wages so this kind of notion, yes, there is room for policy, and education can actually reverse some of that difference that we observe uh, for this level of education. And uh, so this, this is just maybe easier to see about how, what fraction of these outcomes can be really attributed to factors that we know, and we have effective policies, and we know how to think about policies to promote this kind of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, education. The question is, does everybody benefit? And that's a non-trivial issue. And the answer is no. No in several senses. Even if we look at what the distribution is, we can see that when you look at the effect of smoking, what, what, by, what a lot of people call the average treatment effect, the average effect, that there is a negative effect on education. But some people actually go to school and smoke more. We know that. That's you know, pure effects and all of that. And there's also a lot of people who smoke less and a lot of people whose smoking behavior isn't affected. So there's a distributional issue. 
That's one of two distributional issues I want to talk about. For obesity, there's, there's a similar thing. So there are benefits. But then we can go further. And then we can say, OK, if we think about the developmental origins to kind of supplement the framework of sin and sort of move beyond this kind of static notion about inequality, but how inequality emerges over the life cycle, how we can look at the life cycle dynamics. This figure, which may be way too busy, sorry about that, but basically is telling you that if we give this educational intervention, who are the people who benefit the most? Now, this is smoking. And if you look at this, you can see this, this, this uh, dashed blue line is personality skill. So these are people very low in the personality skill. And what we're finding is that people with low sort of self-control and so forth, for them, the education has the greatest, most negative effect. For those people who are high and already in the social and emotional skills, the education, the, the effect is very weak. There's a negative effect over the whole spectrum, but it's particularly strong. It's reversed by, interestingly enough, for those with high levels of cognition. A high level of cognitive skills also seem to benefit as a complementarity with education. So we can see that in the society, each of these policies will have distributive benefits and will affect different people. But there's another. Uh, what is the effect of early endowments? Uh, well, this is the part where early family conditions play a very important role, or can play a very important role. So here we can actually say, OK, we have a set of endowments that more or less are fixed by the time kids are 10 years of age. And we do a comparable analysis at age five. So it's not 10 is kind of a, a conservative notion. But we ask, what factors are most important in terms of uh, reducing smoking? So just if we go within that category of factors that seem to be important and are already formed by age 10 and are beyond policies that we might take after age 10, what's most interesting is that the traits that are most important are early health conditions and uh, conditions related to social and emotional skills. Cognition plays much less of a role. So let me skip past that. And let me talk briefly about one aspect of inequality, which I haven't talked about, which is really important, because I think it gets to Professor Daniel's uh, talk. Namely, that if we think about policies that go before age 10, and we ask now, if suppose we want to reduce the gradient, we can see that for smoking, we have a lot of optimism, that we can even start addressing the inequality after age 10. But for some of the other traits, maybe I should just skip, show you uh, if I can get back to them quickly. Uh, uh, let me get to this, yes. That we can see, for example, things like uh, wage inequality, even things like obesity, those early factors are playing a very important role. Now the question is, can we do anything about those early factors? And the answer is, we can. And let me just uh, conclude and then talk a little bit about research uh, about this. I, I, I will argue that there's an analog of all this, these disparities in, uh, uh, in, in monkeys, and maybe they're even cleaner. So let me just talk very briefly about monkeys. I've been working a lot with monkeys. But monkeys are, uh, these, these rhesus monkeys are very interesting uh, to, uh, to analyze because we can experiment with them in ways we can't with human beings. They're very detailed health histories, more detailed than anything we can get on human beings. And Steve Sumi, working with us and, and several people who are in the room here, graduate students and postdocs, have uh, looked at uh, uh, monkeys that are reared in various conditions. And these now are looking at very early rearing conditions. And so three categories of monkeys. Those are those who are monkeys that are reared with their normal mothers uh, in, in the usual conditions. A way to engineer uh, disadvantage among monkeys is to have them reared by peers without any kind of parental input, without the kind of stimulation of the mother, and then uh, ask uh, what happens to them later in life. And then we can take an even more draconian condition, which is surrogate peer reared. They're raised in a nursery. They're left uh, 22 hours a day alone in a cage. Uh, and then uh, they're, they're basically given a surrogate mother. So this is kind of like putting them in an isolation ward. This is extreme conditions. If you've heard about the Romanian infants, this is the monkey version of the Romanian infants. So what you see when you look at measures of physical health is that early life conditions are playing a huge role. I'm gonna, I've probably run out of time. I, you, can call it, you can call me out at any time. Two minutes, okay. So let me just talk briefly about this. But what, what we can see from these studies, let me just give you one slide and then briefly, uh, and then conclude. That the early life conditions play a major role. They play a major role, and we can actually see the gradient. That the mother-reared monkeys are playing a, uh, are, are, are having, exhibiting the best health 
peer reared somewhere in between, and those put in the isolation ward, if you will, the worst health. But it's more than just some measure of health. You can actually look at the methylation of the gene. You can actually see exactly how genes are methylated by putting them into these three conditions. And so without, I mean, if you gave me another 20 minutes, and they had 10 minutes or five minutes, I, would, I could show you some of this, but you don't want to do that. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, the discussion period, fine. But the, but the point is, is that it, this truly gets under the skin. And so what we find is that 22% of all the genes are differentially methylated, depending on what condition these, and that stays with them, without any further remediation. So the early life conditions are playing a huge role. So yes, there are things we can do after age 10. There are powerful things we can do with education. But if we look at different outcomes, we have to understand that there is a, 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 a complex structure, uh, but it's a complex structure that we can begin to understand. And we do these longitudinal studies. Uh, we have a whole series of intervention studies, experiments, and observational studies that all point in the same direction. That the early years play a very important foundational role. And so uh, this Sunday, I'm actually going to be at a panel on neuroscience in San Diego discussing the impact of the early years, uh, uh, discussing the work of neuroscientists on the impact of poverty and the inequality and extreme deprivation, but even moderate deprivation in moderating brain structures, structures that affect cognition and the structures that play in to determine health through exactly these mechanisms that I, through the process that I showed you. So I'll just conclude by saying this is a very active area of research. I think we can, in some sense, begin to understand how we can develop effective policies. Early childhood policies, for example, a study that I've been reanalyzing, the so-called Perry Preschool Study, which essentially tried to address uh, the status of very disadvantaged uh, uh, African American children in a city outside of Detroit, small city outside of Detroit, Ypsilanti, Michigan. Their uh, longitudinal uh, studies were done, uh, an experiment was conducted, enriching the lives, sort of taking kids out of an extreme deprivation to a situation of being more near, uh, having full parental resources. And what we found from that study, following these children now for close to 40 years, over 40 years, actually it's up to 50 years, we, what we can actually see is we can compute the economic rate of return to investments in the preschool years, exactly like taking these kids out. Now, none of these kids were put in extreme isolation, but they're the analog and human conditions of, of deprivation. Many of those children in the uh, Ypsilanti study uh, who weren't in the uh, treatment group are living in very desperate conditions if you measure it by any measure of parental stimulation and parental environment. And that study has been followed. We've looked at the effects. The economic rate of return on that investment is substantial. You, so you get an efficiency. You get actually a cost effectiveness criteria. The rate of return is 7 to 10% per annum for each dollar invested, which is higher, by the way, than the average return on the US stock market between 1945 and 2008. No, forget the meltdown. I mean, this is the most recent year. The, and it's, forget the last two years. It's still higher. And some of the mechanism is on preventable treatment conditions. So at age 40, you see less drug use, less tobacco use, Less, less uh, in a number of dimensions of health. And the exciting part of the work, some of the work that Gabrielle and I are doing, is essentially talking about how we can intervene and uh, studying a whole variety of these interventions from around the world. So to conclude, I would argue that there isn't such a stark trade-off, as you were saying. I would argue that actually we can, in some sense, have our cake and eat it too. Some part of social justice is actually economically efficient. So we can essentially have policies, at least those that are directed towards the early years, that seem to have a very high economic rate of return, much higher, by the way, than things like job training, much higher than even reducing classroom size, all the traditional investment programs, and reduce inequality in the larger society. So I think that's the good news. But the nice news from a research perspective is a lot more to know, and we're, we're actively engaged, and we just formed a network, uh, the, in, a network around the globe trying to study health inequalities, and I hope we can work actively with all of you. So thank you very much. Fabulous. Thank you. It's, 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 like, it's like we... Uh, 
planned these two talks side by side. Uh, but but it, well, I take no credit for that. Um, our, our third speaker today um, is Dr. Eugene Washington, uh, the Vice Chancellor of the UCLA Health Sciences and Dean of the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Uh, Dr. Washington is an internationally renowned clinical investigator and health policy scholar whose wide-ranging research has been very important in shaping national health policy and practice guidelines. Uh, at UCSF, uh, where he spent many years, um, he chaired the Department of ob and Reproductive Sciences from 1996 to 2004, and also co-founded the Medical Effectiveness Research Center for Diverse Populations at, at UCSF. Uh, he also has done work at the CDC. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Washington, uh, who will speak on eliminating healthcare disparities in the context of national health reform. Please join me in welcome. Okay, while she's preparing that, I'd, I'd like to say, first of all, I'm delighted to be here in Chicago on this brisk, clear fall day. Um, and most of my colleagues would consider me to be a reasonably modest person, uh, but I'm feeling pretty, pretty damn good about my decision making related to this trip. Uh, first, uh, Mark mm -hmm. called me and I accepted the invitation at a time when I was particularly busy, but uh, Mark, I have to tell you, I, I was making that decision under duress. Uh, we have at least three colleagues here, I don't know if she's in the audience. One of them is Dr. Nita Stewart, who uh, I have an IOU that I was going to come to University of Chicago probably for the last uh, five or six years, and you don't want uh, Anita to hold an IOU from you for too long. Another one is Dr. Eric Whitaker, who uh, was applying pressure even more recently, and then uh, one of my former fellows, Dr. Ernst Lingle, uh, Lingle, is here, and so when you call, I was easy prey. Um, but the second important decision that I made was that, um, again, when you're busy, you're trying to use time efficiently. And I had planned to take a night coach uh, last night, which I do these days when I'm flying east. And uh, my wife said, just go the day before and just try and relax. And I said, no, I'll take a night coach. But then an invitation arrived to a dinner. And fortunately, I came and had a, just a wonderful time last night at uh, Mary Ann and Barry McLean's house. Uh, stimulating conversation, delicious food, and just a spectacular view of Chicago. Uh, my decision making on the third account uh, was questioned third, well, Wednesday night uh, when I was with Jeff Bluestone. Some of you will know him. I had dinner. He's a former faculty member here. And I told him, he said, where are you staying? I, had, I said, I had a choice between the Four Seasons and the Quadrangle Club. And I, I chose a Quadrangle Club. He said, bad choice, Gene. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but he didn't realize that I am suck, such a sucker for old buildings and being on college campuses. And I, I loved my stay there and my breakfast this morning. And then the final decision was Mark and his colleagues were insisting that they pick me up and drive me here. And I say, well, it's on campus. That's one of the reasons I chose. They said, no, it's too far. You're going to get lost. And so last night, arguing with him on the sidewalk, I convinced him. Uh, working at CDC, I've traveled around the world. I've been in some dark spots. I can make my way to the law school. <laughs> and unquestionably, it, what, if it's a quarter mile or an eighth of a mile, it is a magnificent walk, particularly this time of year. I did not want to stop walking. Uh, however, I did, and I'm here, and I'm delighted to be here. With that as a background for how I arrived here, I'd like to start with the title and point out a couple of things. I'm going to ask you to shift gears. We've been talking big picture, and we've been talking about determinants of health. As someone with a public health and a policy background, I will tell you that those determinants of health, just in terms of overall health status, are going to make much, much more difference in terms of the population's health than the health care in the aggregate. No question about it. However, in this country, while we should be spending more on those determinants, the truth is we're spending most of our money related to health on health care. Uh, as of last year, we were over $2.5 trillion. And so when we talk about disparities in health care, we're talking about justice, 
Uh, we're also talking about the economic losses as a result of that. But we're also talking about some contribution to the overall health status. And so this focus is rather than talking about health in the context of, of national health reform, is going to focus on really health care disparities. And by disparities, we're talking about the delta or the gap uh, between health care that's received. For the most part, uh, the reference group is white population. Uh, but in some cases, it's by age, or in some cases, it's related to gender, men versus women. In some cases, it's related to people with disabilities versus those who don't have disabilities. For the most part, I'm going to be using examples as related to disparities as it relates to racial, ethnic disparities. Uh, there's considerable overlap between racial, ethnic disparities and disparities related to socioeconomic status. But you're going to see that there's going to be considerable overlap here. And so th with that as a background, I'm going to plan to cover, address three questions. One has to do with the question of what are the goals of national health reform? And I'm going to particularly focus on the actual act itself, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Two, in the context of this act, which is just really one component of national health reform, I will emphasize that to you, because people often ask me what happens if aspects of the national health reform law is repealed or whatever, is, that, is, is, is health reform dead? The, question, the answer to that is definitely not. Health reform started before the enactment of the law in, uh, in March, and it will continue regardless of what happens in Congress over the next year or two years. And then I will make a comment about what I think the priorities should be. This is, rather than thinking of this as a really, this is a data driven presentation in that I will provide you with data. But I can't tell you that it's particularly evidence based in that we don't have, in the case of, uh, of, of, of bending the cost curve, a curve that really tells us where we are with health disparities so that as a result of the interventions that are inherent in the current act, we could say we bend the curve. Uh, however, we do have some measures that we are tracking to let us determine whether or not, and I'm going to show you some of those uh, data. So let's start with the first major goals of it. Uh, most people would agree that the three highest level major goals relate to expanding uh, coverage so that the argument is that this is really about health insurance reform. Second goal would be improving, uh, sorry, second goal would be improving quality of care and third would be reducing health care costs. So before I go on a question for the group, everyone in here, you've read something about it in the paper, or you or have involved, been involved yourself here in Chicago and Washington, or you've got a friend that has always been in your ear about what's happening and what's not going to happen. Based on what you've heard, how many of you believe that the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the current legislation, is going to overall, in the next nine years, going to expand coverage uh, in the US, and particularly in a favorable way for health disparities. How many of you believe it's going to? OK, great. How many of you think it's going to worsen? OK. And so the rest of you think it's going to, uh, how many of you think it's going to be the same? How many of you are uncertain? OK. What about improved quality of care? How many of you think that, again, we're talking about now health disparities. So those measures in the bill designed to improve quality of care, what effect are they going to have on the disparity sort of equation? In other words, that gap in quality that currently exists between the reference population and uh, what, whatever the other group is, in partic particularly racial and ethnic groups. How many of you think it's going to these marriages are actually going to improve the disparities gap, quality of care. Okay, so I have, how many of you think it's going to worsen? Okay, you know I need to control for those who are raising their hand and worsen as to who are the pessimists and the optimists in the group. Uh, but we'll do that at a later time. And then how many of you, when it comes to reducing uh, uh, health care costs, and this is a tricky one, but how many of you think the measures that are designed to reduce costs 
will lead to an improvement in uh, health disparities. Okay? How many of you think it will worsen? And how many of you think it will be the same? Okay? So this talk is going to be about trying to get at what is in here to give you some additional information about how you might judge that. This is what I came up with. Um, and I'm going to come back to it. And throughout it, you're going to, I allowed myself essentially four check marks for each row. And I distributed them based on sort of the emphasis uh, with the belief that overall, everything about this convinces me that it is going to expand coverage. And I think the numbers are going to reflect that very clearly. Uh, I'm with the group that I think it's mixed when it comes to quality. And that will come out in a minute. In the case of reducing costs, uh, uh, it, could be, it could be balanced. And there are two dimensions to the cost, and I will explain that to you as I go, uh, as I go along. Okay, expanding coverage. Uh, we know what the problem is. The problem is we talk about about 47 or so million people in the U.S. that are uninsured. And we talk about the non-elderly in particular because for the most part the elderly should be covered by Medicare. Okay. Uh, but what this graph shows, and it's the most, probably the most important point, is, is that while 30% of these racial and ethnic groups constitute 30% of the population, they make up more than 50% of those that are uninsured in the U.S. So when we start talking about coverage and we start talking about insurance, it's going to disproportionately advantage uh, underserved and minority populations who, for the most part, suffer uh, the disparities, or at least are, are, are related to the disparities we see in healthcare. Okay. For those of you who are wondering what this is, uh, I discovered this only when I was putting this data together. This is Native Hawaiians and other Pacific <laughs> Islanders. I didn't know that we were using such a category. Okay, so let's look at this. There are really three dimensions to the coverage when I think about it. Uh, now, I know many of you are going to say you don't have individu individual mandate on there, but it's inherited here. And let's start with the implications. And again, we're talking about the implications for health care disparities. And let's start here with the employer mandate. And the experts in here are going to immediately say, but Gene, there is no mandate that employees provide health insurance. And that's very true. However, the penalties on employers, if in fact they're employees, if you're an employer and you have more than 50 employees, and your employer, employees go and, 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 and obtain coverage through this exchange because you do not provide options, then you get penalized. So in that sense, this group of employees with 50 more employees are being incentivized to provide coverage. Now, how does that benefit in terms of the racial, uh, uh, particularly racial ethnic minorities? When you look at the groups that I just said were the least covered, in, in general, uh, unemployment rates are higher, but even when they are employed, they're employed in lower level jobs and in smaller companies. And, and so they would have been the ones in the group disproportionately where the insurers or where the companies didn't provide insurance. Now you're going to have more of those individuals being covered right here by the employee mandate, just from a coverage perspective. Let's take the health exchanges. This is the idea now that you're going to be have different groups of insurers participating through an exchange where citizens can go and get health care. What's important when you look at the exchange is, is that in this category, there are going to be premium uh, 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 benefits and there are going to be cost sharing for any individual that has an income up to 400% of the federal poverty level. Now, the federal poverty level is about $11,000 for an individual, and it's about $22,000 for, uh, for a family. And so up to 400%, that's up to $88,000 minimum in this case for a family is going to be about uh, $26,000, $27,000. It now means that many individuals will have, in fact, the exact number that falls in this category that I just described from 133% to 400% it's about 19 million individuals. And six out of 10, over half of that group 
are those racial and ethnic minorities that I just talked about. So by definition, you can do the numbers there. As a result of these exchanges, you're going to see more coverage. The same would be said here, and it's an even simpler, uh, simpler equation. We talk about Medicaid expansion. Right now, Medicaid already covers women, uh, pregnant women, those with disabilities, and children under 133% of the poverty level. In this group alone, um, is about 22 million individuals of that 46, 47 that I just talked about. So now all of a sudden they're all going to be covered or at least have some coverage. So if you just do the arithmetic, then you can see that we're talking about as a result of this, probably half or more of those uh, underserved un uh, uh, individuals who weren't covered now being covered as a result of the health reform legislation. But coverage is one thing. Those of us who work in the field know that coverage does not mean access. And there are some measures in here that are also going to help to improve access. This just dramatizes the problem again in terms of the number. This is one of the ways that we measure access. And it's just a graph showing the number of uh, a percent of individuals in a population who have what we call usual source of care. And usual source of care in this case has to do with the fact that you've got a primary care doctor or there's some clinic or some place you go to on a regular basis rather than the episodic care where you just show up at an emergency room. And uh, what I'll show you, you can see that the rates are significantly higher uh, for African Americans, for uh, American Indians and uh, Native Alaskans, and for uh, Hispanics and for Asian compared to white population. Okay, same thing. This is also getting at the issue of access to, to care. And this is quite simple, it may look complicated, but um, AHRQ, which is Agents for Healthcare Quality and Research, it's a federal agency analogous to the National Institutes of Health. They collect data on some measures of access. So in fact, one of the measures is what I just showed you. What percent of the population actually has uh, um, uh, an ongoing provider. Um, another, another measure might be of individuals who come in, they collect data on how many of those individuals delayed care because in fact they didn't have regular. So that would be. And what this just shows is, is that when you look at those measures, and there were, in this case that would have been five measures, um, if we look at the black as improving, okay, and this would be the African American group compared to the whites, just as an example, uh, two of those measures in, uh, we improved, one of the measures say it's, remained the same, and over this period of time, which is up there, two different periods, two of those measures worsened. So you can see that just in terms of access, when you look in the rear, uh, uh, the impact of different policies that have been in place have been variable over a period uh, of time but that, that still remains a problem of access, even with coverage. And while I think that there will be improvement here, there will still be some areas uh, where there's not improvement, okay? Uh, other provisions, without going into detail, I'll just direct you to it, that are related to access, is for the populations that we just talked about, particularly the populations that suffer disproportionately from uh, disparities in health outcome. Those are the populations that frequent, sorry, I keep doing that, the community health centers. The community health centers in this country, by definition, have to be located in underserved areas, or at least to have to be in some proximity to underserved populations, or populations that, in fact, are on the lower rung in terms of outcomes. Uh, there are many provisions in the new health reform legislation that uh, are going to enhance community health centers, without going into detail as to what they are. There are also many provisions in here that are aimed at increasing the health care workforce. We tend to think of that as pointing to increasing primary care doctors, but it's more than just focused on primary care doctors uh, and on doctors in general. It's focused on nurses, it's, it's focused on dentists, it's focused on dental hygiene as, as well. And so that these are very, very important provisions and there are policies in place geared toward uh, trying to strengthen access 
for these vulnerable populations and these populations who disproportionately uh, 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 share the burden of the disparities uh, through these two mechanisms. I would underscore that I think this is one of the most important and, and possibly understated uh, uh, goals within the whole uh, health reform movement. And to some degree, um, I'm, I'm joining the crowd that's now arguing that there should be four major goals beyond expanding coverage and beyond improving quality and reducing cost. Uh, this should be a goal in itself, and that is in terms of increasing uh, the healthcare workforce. Okay. Improving quality. Here, this is the definition that we use uh, pr pretty much across the country. It's a definition developed by the Institute of Medicine. So when I say quality, I'm broadly referring to these six measures or these six aims. Uh, quality should be safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. And you've heard discussions this morning uh, from both of our previous speakers uh, about uh, this notion of uh, justice and, uh, and, and, and being equitable. I'm, I'm going to just share with you um, what, again, some data about what has existed and then talk uh, for a few minutes about the current provisions in the law. So going back to the same data, data set that comes from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And what this shows is that when you look at two periods of time, and if we were to take one group being the African Americans, I'll slow down a little bit. So this is African Americans compared to whites. And in this case, there's six, 15, 16 different measures. And you say, okay, what are these quality measures? They would be measures like, some of them related to preventive health care, percent of women getting mammograms, percent of individuals receiving colonoscopy. They're also related to quality measures in the hospital, uh, intravenous uh, I mean, uh, site infections, uh, number of individuals coming into the emergency room admitted for hospitalization that receive aspirin, uh, readmission rates. Uh, and so there's probably 50 measures there but there are some core measures that are felt to really constitute sort of basic quality of health care. And what this shows is over this period of time, at least these two periods of time, that uh, six of these, uh, for six of these measures, there was improvement in terms of the disparity gap for blacks compared to white. For nine of these, uh, there was no change, and for one of these, it was worsened. That's actually quite good. But it still underscores the point that as we think about implementing these policies, those of you who say that the quality could lead to some worsening, that is true. And I will tell you the mechanism in a minute that I think by which uh, that would happen uh, and, and, and one of the reasons why I think it uh, does happen. Okay, here's some of the provisions. Uh, there are two that I'll just bring to your attention. There are many in there that have implications for both quality and cost. In fact, many of the ones related to cost are trying to reduce cost while at the same time improving uh, quality. Uh, the two that I mentioned, though, are first national quality improvement plan that includes the establishment of key national indicators of quality to be tracked by race and ethnicity. The reason why this is important is because in, in, in our haste, which we should be, to focus on improving quality overall to some degree, we forget that uh, some of the interventions that we're going to make in uh, populations that are at the upper end of the socioeconomic uh, status uh, won't have the same impact, in fact, could have an adverse impact on some of the ones that are at the lower socioeconomic level. I'll give you an example would be the emphasis on pay for performance is exactly where I think it should be. But if you're practicing in city A, Midwest city, where the uh, population in, in poverty is 34%, where the median income is 23,000, and where the graduation rate is um, you know, uh, uh, 12%, literally, uh, versus in city B, where 4% uh, live in uh, poverty, and the median income is 73,000, and where the graduation rate, I'm talking about in this case from college, is over 50%, then you're gonna have better outcomes. And if you're a great doctor in the first city, 
you may be a great doctor, but you are practicing with a healthier population and you're going to get rewarded, as you should. But you could be a great doctor in the second city. I'm, 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 I'm flipping my cities. But you could, you could be a great doctor in the city where the population already has poor outcome. And in the end, because you don't show the same change, you could be penalized. And as a result of those penalties, disincentivize the practice in those areas. And it could have a paradoxical adverse effect on the population. Um, the, the, the last thing here is uh, many of you have been hearing about the comparative effectiveness uh, research. Uh, more to come. I happen to be in the group that think that this is an important undertaking as a broad area because I think patients, providers, policymakers want to know and should know what works and what does not work. And so I see this as um, an initiative that's geared toward providing yet uh, another uh, piece of information uh, and it's a decision assisting tool. Uh, as individuals and groups make decisions regarding uh, uh, their choice for different uh, therapies as well as uh, for providers. Reducing cost. Many argue that the, the, the entire health reform legislation is about trying to bend this curve. Uh, and you've, most of you are familiar with the, uh, the data. This is just showing percentage. But we're over $2.5 trillion, as I said. We're spending um, uh, close to $8,000 per U.S. resident. And uh, uh, Dr. D Dr. Daniels, actually, yeah, it was Dr. Daniels, his last slide that showed how you know, our life expectancy was right up there with Luxembourg and all. What it didn't show was how much we pay per sort of uh, citizens compared to what they pay in Luxembourg. Uh, we pay more than anyone uh, anywhere in the world, and in many of those com countries, we have comparable income uh, uh, outcome. But more importantly, um, and I have some economists in here, but no one that I've heard would argue that this is sustainable or we, we want it to be sustainable, because we're looking at close to 18% of the GDP, uh, and, and, and that is quite a bit of money with not real evidence that is we continue to invest more that we will see better outcomes. So it's a question of value. Uh, here are, I would say, just broadly speaking again, the approaches to trying to deal with the cost, but they are connected to quality as well. In the first case, the idea is, is that if we can, we talked about this last night, we can realign incentives. Right now the incentive is on volume, doing as much as we can for you when you come in to see us because we get reimbursed for each test that we provide you. Uh, right now, also, uh, we have more medical students, and somebody asked me recently, they said, Gene, you know, all the medical students, they come in, they're so idealistic, and they're going into primary care, and they're going to conquer the world, and they, you know, they said, what happened to them? Why aren't they going? I said, medical students can count. Um, <laughs> They get there and discover by the second year that the loans are two, three hundred thousand. They they see what the conditions are under which the primary care providers are working, and they also see what the re uh, reimbursement reimbursements are. And so a great deal of emphasis is being placed on not just reimbursement but improving working conditions for primary care providers. And I th I applaud those, and so do most in the country. And in fact. Uh, I suspect that we are going to see some redistribution of funding across sort of the provider spectrum. Uh, the second is the idea of trying to move us away from being incentivized to just do things related to volume. And so this would be a step beyond uh, uh, what, what we would call here sort of um, uh, just individual item care to more episodic care. Rather than seeing a patient and being reimbursed for the visit and for whether or not you get x-rayed, in this case it says if we have a patient that's coming in to see us or come to the hospital, let's for a, uh, an elective uh, uh, cardiac angiography or something like that, we're going to get paid for an episode of care. Everything that's associated with that patient receiving that procedure operation through some period of time. So any complications for the next 90 days, just as an example, you're going to get one payment. Some people refer to this as bundle payment, but we're just going to get one payment. We're incentivized in that case 
to ensure that we provide quality, effective care, but that we also be efficient. It's still focused on the patient that comes in. The higher order of this, which is, I believe, one of the ultimate goals of the uh, health care legislation, is to shift the emphasis more to population-centric uh, care. In this case, accountable care organization forces or incentivizes systems of care, the doctors, the nurses, the dentists, in terms of the providers, but also now we're talking about the hospitals, even the long-term care institutions are now joined in a collaborative, in a consortium, because they're now being given uh, payment to take care of a population of individuals. Uh, if this succeeds, it is definitely going to not only shift, I believe, ultimately the, the cost curve, but I think it's going to shift emphasis more to preventive and to uh, uh, a wellness and to a more, more of a focus on some of these determinants of health uh, and away from some of the curative medicine. I continue to emphasize to people, the curative medicine uh, is always going to be there. We're going to always need you know, the state of the art, premier, high technology, cutting edge care that's provided at the University of, uh, of Chicago. And I don't think that you're going to ever uh, run out of the need for that. But at the same time, it would be great if we had even more emphasis on wellness and on health promotion prevention. And this is what accountable care organizations are designed to achieve, along with reducing costs, but also improving quality. And, and this is in there. Uh, because of time, I'll just say there are some uh, specific items in there related to uh, health disparities. They mostly focus on ensuring that we have data so that we can monitor it. Uh, this is a big one for me, and I go back to the health work workforce. It's not just improving the number of providers, but it's also improving their core competency in dealing with this diverse population that we just alluded to. Uh, the same thing here, only the focus is on individuals, particularly many of the individuals who are now for the first time going to have uh, coverage provided with them is ensuring that the the language used in registering them, but also providing the care, the language is culturally and linguistically uh, uh, appropriate. Um, some prevention-related priorities, just you know, which is good news for the prevention and health promotion-oriented individuals in the audience here. You can see that there are some features in there related to that as well. So I come back to the original question I asked you. Um, I think most of us, and most of you did raise your hand, uh, would agree that from a, again, health disparities, health care disparities perspective, I think that this will improve. Uh, there's no reason logically, just thinking analytically, why it should worsen it, you know, but there are always unique circumstances uh, that uh, could lead to worsening that are unpredictable at this point. Here, improved quality of care. I just want to explain the one here, which is this one. Uh, I put that there because I think that this is going to be driving a great deal by our ability to, in fact, expand the workforce and to expand the workforce to include individuals who, in fact, have the right core competency. If, for example, in the short run, all of a sudden we have uh, an expansion of coverage. So we have many individuals who didn't have coverage before. Uh, and many of those individuals are not in uh, lower socioeconomic status, many of those individuals that, in fact, are not uh, in these racial ethnic minorities, um, what will happen is, is that many of these individuals who are currently suffering from these disparities will get pushed down a little further and will have an even worse access problem despite the coverage in the short run. The people are just not going to be there to provide the coverage. And those that are going to be there and going to be available without uh, considerable emphasis on this workforce are just not going to be prepared to handle this new major influx of individuals. So I could see in the short term that there could be some worsening overall in the quality. That's one. The other has to do with just when you really start putting emphasis, which is the right place, on value and pay for performance. If I'm a provider and I know that I'm going to be measured by the outcomes in this population, then I'm going to want to start with the healthiest populations. 
and some of the others are going to get marginalized because you're not going to want it to. Add. I mean, this is what insurance companies do or have done, just in terms of a uh, of risk pool. So that would be no different from this. So um, I would put a question mark uh, here, or really a concern. I think it will worsen in the short term. In the cost, um, I, I, I certainly don't put all the, the, the checks here because I don't think it's going to improve all uh, overall. I, um, I, I think a great deal would be the same. You know, the only reason I didn't put one here, the truth is, because I'm, I'm an optimist. Uh, and, and I struggled with that one. And optimism in me says that curve can't continue. We're intelligent people in this country. We've always been ready to respond, you know, before we went over the cliff. Uh, and I think we're going to respond in this case. And in the end, we are going to have the will to bend uh, the cost curve in this country. And so I do not think that nine years from now, in 2090, at the end of this legislation, that uh, things will be worse as it relates to cost. Um, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I usually use this side. Uh, I've used it a couple of times in a context of really innovation. We got to think out of the box. This is one case where I'm saying, you know, most of it is right there, and it's right there in the legislation. Uh, but I point out to my colleagues that the legislation is really a framework. Um, and it, it, it provides broad policy guidelines. It's going to get shaped over the next, really, 10 years. It's being shaped now uh, by individuals af across the spectrum of providers and policymakers and consumers. Uh, but what needs to be done, it's, it's, it doesn't really require that we get too far out of the box, because most of the out of the box thinking has been done. And I'm just going to work just very quickly. Five things, Vermont. We need to strengthen the data. Again, this is from a health dis care disparities perspective. We need this data so we know exactly where we are, so that in fact we could constitute something like a health disparities curve and know whether or not we're bending it and know what the trajectory looks like. Uh, this is a key point for me. We've got to get the adequate number of providers. Uh, this one is a key because it relates to the accountable care organization and these new models. CMS, which is a uh, Center for Medicaid Medicaid uh, Services, billions of dollars, new dollars that have been made available to test these models. But the models can't be tested just in those healthcare systems that have proven to be effective, but they prove to be effective quite often in populations that are already reasonably served and with reasonably good outcomes. And then the final two I would just mention here is advanced best practices for health promotion and disease prevention. We just haven't done much of that from a health care perspective, and that should be done. And there are funds in this new legislation to do that. And then finally, which is what I see as one of the major outcomes of a, of a seminar and gathering like this, is to continue to, wait, to raise awareness about uh, of, of the issue. Um, my last slide is to reiterate the point uh, that my uh, colleague, Professor Singer, made uh, uh, in his presentation is that this really is a global, uh, uh, um, this really is a global problem when we talk, talk talking about health disparities uh, and health care disparities. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor. Uh, to be here and thank you very much for inviting me uh, uh, and uh, the timing is, is uh, pretty interesting considering the elections uh, yesterday uh, and particularly with the, uh, uh, with the connection to uh, Chicago. Uh, I'm going to be talking for about 35 or 40 minutes um, and right up front I want to say that 70 to 80 percent of the work that I'll be describing here involves my dear friend and colleague Peter Singer who uh, is unfortunately um, not so well this week. He was due to come here next week to give a talk at the Fellows Conference but won't be there and uh, we are hoping that uh, we'll be able to reproduce some of my comments. So consider this as a presentation from both myself and my colleague Peter Singer. Uh, so. Um, I will describe uh, our work mainly. Um, some of it is not yet in the literature or is uh, not in an accessible form. 
Uh, and so it will be quite new and I hope that we'll have a lot of time afterwards to discuss that. So let me first of all start with the definition of global health. It's it's one of those things that's uh, a little like the elephant and the uh, blind men. Uh, it hasn't settled yet as to exactly what it is. The, my favorite <coughs> definition is this one, health uh, from the Institute of Medicine report. Health problems, issues, and concerns that transcend national borders uh, may be influenced by circumstances or experiences in other countries and are best addressed by cooperative actions and solutions. And that packs a lot of implications uh, which I hope uh, will emerge as we, as we discuss issues today. So look at this picture. On the right, uh, you have uh, people living in North America, Western Europe, and the rich countries of the world uh, expecting to live 80 years after uh, at birth. Uh, on the left, you have Sub-Saharan Africa mainly and other places in the world, but mainly Sub-Saharan Africa, where life expectancy is still 40 years and to some extent in a few countries actually dropping. And so that immediately uh, raises uh, two questions. First of all, how can this be acceptable? We are one species, we live in one planet. Uh, how can this be fair? How can it be sustainable? And the second question is, what can you do about it? So that's uh, partly why Peter and I got involved in uh, global health. Look at the disparities in global health. And I won't enumerate many of these because the list can go on for hours. So every second of every day, a woman, four women will give birth. And every minute, one of those women would die. Uh, for every woman who dies, another 30 suffer lifelong consequences as a result of complications of their pregnancy or the delivery. And that's not to mention the kids who grow up uh, in utero with malnourished mothers or who grow up in very uh, constrained circumstances which then leave lasting legacy of uh, being exposed to metabolic and cardiovascular diseases and mental health problems. So it's a huge problem predicated on poverty uh, as one of the issues. I also want to highlight a, a uh, human rights element to global health. So some of you may be familiar with Amartya Sen's uh, article uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago uh, in the New York Review of Books about a hundred million missing women. And those missing women are what you would have expected in a particular country to exist, but don't exist because the human rights situation, particularly vis-a-vis -vis right, uh, for the rights of women, are such that those women uh, die early uh, or somehow disappear. Now, poor health affects the poor predominantly, including in the United States. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this statistic that uh, in Washington, D.C., as you go down the subway from the richer parts of the city to the poor parts of the city, for every two and a half kilometers along that path, life expectancy drops by one and a half years. So this is a problem between the developed and the developing world, but even in the developed world there are disparities, and some of the talks that you will be covering, including here in Chicago, will highlight those issues. Now, infectious diseases have received a large part of the attention in the past decade or so. HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, neglected tropical diseases. Um, and that has actually attracted some significant funding from uh, many sources, uh, the biggest source being the Gates Foundation, uh, to address some of the uh, real big challenges uh, facing us with regards to infectious diseases. Part of this is humanitarian impulses uh, and part of it, as I will show you in a minute, is uh, national security considerations. So viruses do not carry passports um, and that has been one of the factors that I said. But then neither does climate change or environmental degradation. So people think about infectious diseases but do not give as much attention 
to the health implications of climate change and environmental degradation, and those two don't uh, respect borders. Now, our consumption patterns in North America and in the rich countries uh, of the world are such that directly or indirectly we harm people in the developing world. Take our meat consumption, the fact that we have to use good land uh, to uh, produce feed crops, to feed the cattle, uh, with all the environmental implications of that uh, to the rest of the world and all those uh, uh, greenhouse gases released. Uh, but also we export things like tobacco aggressively. The markets here are saturated, people are smoking less, so what do we do? We export that to the developing world and that's a huge problem as we will see in a minute. And then a focus uh, of my work over the past uh, uh, four years on chronic non-communicable diseases. So let me just now begin to talk about this idea of grand challenges. What is a grand challenge as it has evolved? Uh, you may be familiar with the grand challenges in mathematics about 100 years ago uh, that led to uh, departments of mathematics all over the world focusing on those grand challenges. But as it has evolved, particularly uh, with our work with the Gates Foundation and more recently, a grand challenge is a specific critical barrier. So for example, if you don't have a, a, a vaccine against malaria, the answer is, uh, is the, the question is, what is the critical barrier? Why haven't we done that? We've been researching this for 50 years. So it is about focusing on the barriers, the critical barriers, uh, that if removed would help solve an important health problem in the developing world uh, with a high likelihood of impact globally uh, through widespread, uh, widespread implementation. And implementation is now becoming a science in its own right. Uh, more money is going to go into implementation research in the future, uh, in the next few years, than perhaps in any other area of global health uh, research. So I'm going to describe uh, four initiatives that uh, have the name Grand Challenge uh, in, uh, connected to them. One is the Gates Foundation Grand Challenges in Global Health Initiative, uh, which was launched seven years ago. Uh, then the Grand Challenges in Chronic Non-Communicable Diseases, uh, uh, Grand Challenges Canada, which uh, I've just talked about and I'll say more in a few minutes, and then lastly, the work, uh, some of the work that uh, I'm involved in at the moment with NIH and the Wellcome Trust and others in uh, identifying what are the Grand Challenges in Global Mental Health. And I, and I think for me, that's, uh, and I'm sure for many people, that's the next uh, big, big uh, challenge to, to, to address. Uh, so th this approach of grand challenges, which is quite different from funding research in the traditional way. You're all familiar with the NIH way, you put in your ideas, it goes through peer review, etc. Et Here is a, a rather different approach. It's more hands-on, it's based on those critical barriers that we need to do, and we will fund the best ideas without bureaucracy. And if someone comes with a great idea presenting a two-page proposal, we'll fund it. Uh, and we'll see if they can take it to the next stage. That kind of approach. Um, and it's brought in very significant resources. The, uh, Bill Gates put in, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation put in $450 million to address um, uh, 14 grant challenges and funded just 44 uh, research projects. Just 44. 400 and $50 million or more. Secondly, let me talk about uh, chronic non-communicable diseases. So just let me paint the scene here for you. So about, I'm sorry, I don't know what I did there. No. Oh, I, I, okay. So about 60 million people die every year. And people imagine that uh, a lot of people in the developing world die from infectious diseases. Well, it's not so. Uh, of the 60 or so million people who die, um, about half die from cardiovascular disease, 30% die from cardiovascular disease, cancer kills about 15%, chronic respiratory diseases, 7%, and diabetes, although it looks like 2%, actually diabetes causes cardiovascular disease, causes stroke, and so on, so it's grossly underestimated what diabetes does. And then if you look at uh, communicable diseases, 
maternal and perinatal conditions and nutritional deficiencies, which are big killers, all that amounts to only 30%. So chronic diseases, which are cardiovascular diseases, mainly heart disease and stroke, certain cancers, not all of them, not, doesn't include infectious cancers, uh, chronic respiratory conditions, which kill more than two million people just from indoor pollution alone, uh, and diabetes, that has been an area that has been totally neglected in the developing world, understandably partly because they have to deal with, uh, with uh, tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, other neglected diseases, and what's the budget? The budget in many sub-Saharan African countries for health is $20, $25 per person per year. Uh, w which is remarkably low. So how, how do you deal with this kind of problems? The risk factors are actually pretty well understood. Uh, not, not exactly how they interact and what you can do about them, but it's tobacco. So uh, smoking will kill one billion people this century if we don't do anything about it. One billion people. Uh, unhealthy diet, so both overnutrition and undernutrition, physical inactivity, uh, and harmful use of alcohol. So um, at the end of that paper, we said chronic non-communicable diseases must urgently receive more resources, research, and attention as mapped out in these grand challenges. Inaction is costing millions of premature deaths throughout the world. So. Um, you can't just end with that. What do you do having identified this crucial need? So we went ahead and got together uh, NIH, the Canadians, uh, Australians, Chinese, and we created this global alliance for chronic diseases. And you can read about it in a, in a piece in science at the time we launched it. And uh, so that's Betsy Nabel, a visionary uh, who was at the time the director of uh, NHLBI at NIH. National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. She's now president and CEO of Brigham and Women's in, uh, in uh, Boston. The, the head of the Canadian uh, body, which is equivalent to the NIH, the head of the British body, Chinese, Australian, and we've also got uh, India now coming aboard and South Africa. So what is this uh, Global Alliance about? So it's a funding agency. It's an alliance of funders. Together, these six uh, agencies account for about 80% of all research funding available for uh, biomedicine and health. It's the first of its kind. It focuses on chronic diseases in low and middle income countries and low income populations of high income countries. It supports collaborative coordinated research at global scale uh, on low cost interventions and capacity building. And it ident identifies common approaches to provide the evidence that policymakers need in order to put in uh, uh, programs. So that's what that's about. And, and we can discuss a little more about uh, what are the priorities, what are we going to be funding first, and so on when we come to the discussion. Now let me transition to Grand Challenges Canada, which in some ways is even more exciting because it is a policy development of a government. Uh, which is very creative, as you will see. So Grand Challenges Canada is an organization. It's a funding body. Uh, it's not-for-profit organization. Peter Singer is the CEO. I'm the chief scientist. It's a consortium uh, with two uh, government-related bodies in Canada, the International Development Research Center, which uh, has a mandate to do research for development for the developing world, and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which is the, our NIH equivalent. It's governed by a very tough and strong uh, board of directors. Uh, it's uh, advised by an international scientific advisory board, which I happen to chair, and is hosted by the McLaughlin Rotman Center, as, as we heard. Uh, its mission is to identify grant challenges. So uh, from an idea, you test it. You say, well, this is important. You then go and uh, talk to content experts, and you go through a scientific advisory board, identify a grand challenge. So phone me and, my, and I, after this talk, will be discussing one of these uh, in the area of cancer to see whether it's something worth funding. Uh, and then you get the board to say, well, this is great. 
put in this much money and develop an RFP. So it's a, it's a really exciting kind of, of, of work. Uh, and uh, we will support implementation and commercialization of the solutions that emerge. So we are building a capacity to actually support commercialization, which is not an easy thing to do. So uh, we've got 20, $225 million for five years to just do five programs. One of them is going to be in chronic non-communicable diseases. One is going to be in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, point-of-care diagnostics, and another one in maternal neonatal child health, and we are working on others, but just five. Uh, and the government, in its budget 2008, talked about supporting the best minds in the world as they search for breakthroughs in global health and other areas. So that other areas they haven't yet funded. There might be funding of equivalent uh, amounts for, let's say, energy or agriculture. Uh, but those have yet to unfold. Now here's the, here's the clincher and the most important part of all this. This money comes out of the foreign aid budget of Canada, about 5% of the foreign aid budget. And uh, this is the first time that any country in the world has taken the risk of taking money out of foreign aid budget and putting it into this kind of grand challenges approach to solve problems for the benefit of the developing world. Uh, and, and that's controversial. We can discuss that, uh, whether that's the right way to spend foreign aid money or not. Uh, but if other countries did take this up, then this could be a way to get a lot of money into global health and other areas, environment, energy, uh, agriculture, etc., to solve real problems uh, rather than simply hand out money, which sometimes doesn't work. So the floor is now open for questions and uh, comments. Uh, yes, yes, please. It was a very interesting talk that uh, Dr. Washington was giving, but I completely agree. It crossed my mind as you were saying, you know, how can we actually be sitting here on the same panel? And I do think there has been an overemphasis. I mean, a huge amount of expenditure has been on treatment and much less on prevention. And I think part of it has been because the determinants of what determinants are probably less securely established. And I think maybe in, in medicine, in epidemiology, there's been such a focus on just on, on health and how early health behaviors affect later health behavior and how this disease is treated by this drug. And only recently are we coming into this kind of developmental uh, process of understanding what it is, how disease is interacting with a larger social system and how changing other parts of the social system will affect the healthcare system. So I do think there's a tremendous imbalance. And I was a little sad that the uh, discussions this last six months or so emphasized too much healthcare and too little prevention. It could have been more money spent, for example, on early childhood and, and their, uh, educational interventions that I think could have prevented the problem. I guess I, I'm a little less optimistic than you are about the bill as I've understood it to this date because they didn't see where they were really bending the curve. And this is one way to bend the curve, it's kind of get rid of the problem from the, the get-go. So I, I, I think it's a great question, and I would uh, turn it over to you. <laughs> to see. So my view is that, yes, there was an imbalance, and there is right now. And I think it's partly just the way fields get set up, that people say, OK, well, this is, so we have a group of people studying education over here. We have a group of people studying health over here. We have some personality psychologists standing over here. There aren't very many people putting all these three ingredients together, and those are the ingredients you need to understand how to build a healthy society and get the people. So we probably would need less disease, or sorry, we'd need less treatment of disease that if we actually had uh, made those kinds of investments. So I do think we have to prioritize. I think you're gonna find a very tough sell to find anything near seven to 10% rate of return in terms of anything that I've seen discussed in a specific way in the current healthcare that bill in the last six or seven months. And I, and I simply can't understand one thing you said, which is how it is possible to treat 20 to 40 million new people and not increase cost, and increase it in a, in a, in a fundamentally uh, powerful way. I mean, as an economist, I would say we have a relatively fixed supply, and you've shifted the demand 
the price has to go up, maybe not as much as some people say, and one way to do it is to sort of get rid of the problem. So I would have thought that Professor, uh, 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 that, that President Obama, uh, Professor Obama, again, this is one of his classrooms, so, uh, and I knew him in that role, but uh, it would, would, would have thought maybe a little more comprehensively about health care and social policy, because it was part of his budget, is part of his campaign pledge, and you know, a lot of things have happened the last uh, two years. But I would argue that anything I didn't really say, and I've been led, to, given the opportunity to say, is we want to be much more comprehensive. And uh, so we say, do we have complete details? No, but I would say we actually know more about the health effectiveness of these early interventions and other types of interventions uh, than we might know about certain kinds of uh, cost reduction strategies in, in the healthcare policy uh, arena. Could, could I just comment that, um, you know, I haven't seen the latest estimate, but um, uh, it's estimated, I mean, it's in the, it's in the billions, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars that, uh, um, that are estimated to be wasted in the healthcare system. And so uh, uh, one way that, that many who work within that system believe that uh, you're going to uh, be able to provide more services, better services uh, to a population is to eliminate that waste. Right now, there is no incentive, zero, for us to eliminate that waste. And even if I put on my societal cap, um, I'm currently in charge of a, uh, you know, one of those state-of-the-art academic health centers with, you know, over $2 billion in revenues a year that feeds our entire academic health enterprise. Uh, and, um, I mean, I would get hauled into the town square tomorrow and, and, and tarred and feathered and then shot if I were talking about, okay, let's, let's give back the money. So the, this is a problem across the country, and if, and I, it, I am an optimist, you know, so I'm, <laughs> I'm a little maybe too Pollyannish, because uh, I think we need to bend that curve, but more importantly, if in fact it could happen, I'm not saying it's gonna happen in the next nine years, but if in fact it could happen such that, and we've seen it happen in some other areas, such that the incentives align to in fact focus more on the prevention and on the promotion, then I think we would see better quality overall just in terms of what we do for patients. And prevention is a great deal, much cheaper than, uh, than actual uh, uh, cure. I, I'm gonna take two quick questions, quick questions, and then let the panel wrap up. Uh, I'm not as uh, expert on the, uh, uh, this literature as, as Dr. Heck uh, probably is, but uh, from what I know, um, uh, the cross-country studies of income inequality that exist, uh, the initial ones were quite flawed. I mean, uh, uh, Wilkinson did a study of the OECD countries and did a very select group and showed an, uh, a result, and then it, um, it disappeared when you looked at a broader group. Um, uh, Subramanian and Kawachi have looked at uh, some of the international studies, and their suggestion is that you have to have be above some threshold of inequality before you start to get any difference at all uh, that shows up in the cross-country studies. So, for example, they see some effects in Chile, and if one were looking at some middle-income countries where uh, perhaps income inequality might, might be very small in some in middle-income countries, but at least as large as Chile and others, you might see some differences. I don't know of those studies specifically that ban the countries by uh, income levels. Uh, one is, you, you, you suggested that it's going to be very challenging, and, and I agree with that. Uh, uh, however, I, I do think that it's uh, doable. I mean, some of the data that I showed you from the 
Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research. And um, again, I only stumbled on this data as a result of preparing for this talk, but I was impressed that, that they have improved in the last five years since they've been developing this report. And uh, the emphasis has been on increasing uh, the metrics. Uh, and there's some very smart people working in this arena looking at how do we validate uh, the metrics that are being developed across different populations. And I tend to think of this whole metric mapping similar to the Human Genome Project where you've got lots of different people working on it, but once you can agree upon sort of some standards for how you go about testing various pieces, different groups can test the pieces so that eventually you've got a metric map for the country that people agree on with some baseline measure. So I think it's doable and I certainly believe that uh, an important step is the investment that's being made uh, through the current uh, health reform uh, legislation. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I mean, I, I don't think I should add much to what you say. You know quite a bit about the literature. And uh, I, I would simply say that I'm a little bit worried about stopping there with just the income inequality health. So there is, there is a relationship. Pickett and Wilkinson have been probably the most active in advocating this. And there has been exactly the kind of controversy that Dr. Daniels was talking about. But uh, I, I would make the, the following statement that there is a uh, real issue about whether or not it's income equality per se that's arising. So even if you took the facts, the simple facts, even without the subtlety that was just given, I would wonder, and I think that's been the issue that's been heavily contested. Angus Deaton, for example, has written on this, and many people have written that it may not just even be income. You know, there's the question of reverse causality, you know, people who actually happen to be uh, very uh, sick generally have low incomes and, 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 and so forth and so on. And so I think we probably need a deeper understanding of just the nature of social inequality than just looking at income. And I think what I worry about, to be honest, is an episode that occurred in social policy in the United States some 50 years ago. We saw there was a tremendous amount of income inequality, not just racial inequality, but various kinds of inequality. And so the idea was, well, what we should do is give people more income and redistribute income. And we did it. And we did it very effectively for 15 or 20 years. And we reduced the measure of inequality in the society. And then some 20, 25 years later, about the time when President Clinton was president, we had this welfare reform that came precisely because many people recognized that just transferring income, just reducing inequality was not reducing poverty and wasn't even really having that much of an effect on health and many other determinants. And so the notion was we have to think more broadly about just what inequality stands for. And, and that's what I think the thrust of it is. And so the Welfare Reform Act is one result. I don't think we want to make the same mistakes we made in the 1960s and just say redistribution per se will do the job. I think it's deeper than that. Um, I agree, but disagree. Um, <laughs> so I agree that it, it may not be just income and the story may be more complex. I disagree with the last remark because my understanding of American studies of inequality in general don't quite match the dates that were just given. Uh, that we had a period in the United States of decreasing any social and economic inequality overall from roughly the mid-40s to the mid-70s. And then we began a long slide of inequality increase. Uh, and the Clinton welfare reforms was in the middle of a period of very significant uh, inequality increases. Um, uh, and it may, be, have, may have been driven by the particular ideology about dependence that was true, and for all I know, there may be some basis to it, but um, that was not an attempt to correct uh, inequalities in the society. If you had wanted to do that, you would have changed the tax cuts that began with uh, uh, Reagan and um, uh, the, uh, you would have increased the degree to which the working class participated in productivity increases in this country. Wait, just, just uh, one, one last remark. <laughs> I, I, been, I lost control a long time. <laughs> no, no. No, but, it, but I, I, if, you look at the, if you look at the data on, on income transfers reduce inequality, we do know that. I mean, Lampman and a whole group of people at the University of Wisconsin studied that. And you're certainly correct, though, starting in the 1970s, 
With globalization, with the onset of what many economists have described as skill bias technical change, the demand and technology for more skilled workers, there's been a secular increase towards widening wage inequality in the labor market. That's a, that's a force on top of it. All I was talking about with the Clinton reforms was simply that the idea that somehow we were going to end poverty by giving transfers, I think that failed. That I think we understood. But I'm not suggesting that poverty and that inequality did not increase. We're a much more unequal society now than we were, say, in 1970. But there are a lot of societies that play that role. Our, our Gini coefficient is close to that of Mexico, for example, and it wasn't anywhere near that in 1970. But many people would blame or would at least attribute that to the rise to, to global economic factors, which have to be combated. And then I'd get back to kind of closing the circle and say, how do we then say, if the skill is in greater demand, what should we do? We produce more skill. And yet, as of this day, the high school graduation rate is actually declining. We're having more dropouts in the US society now than we did in 1970. And again, I think we have to put these pieces together. Health inequalities, in part, due to these same educational inequalities. So we have to think more deeply. I don't think just a transfer will do it. We have to create the skills, the motives, and to use the word of sin, the capabilities, I think, that really expand the opportunity set. And it's much more than just a transfer of income. No disagreement. <laughs>